next panel is uh, a panel of the uh, seminarians uh, this year, and it's chaired by uh, Mike Skirker, who's uh, associate professor, recently tenured in leadership ethics and law here at the Naval Academy. And uh, you'll notice that there's an extra person on the panel. His name is Marcus Haydall. Uh, he was not here on the first panel because of a culpable, pro uh, a culpable mistake by me, and uh, therefore I am liable to any punishment that Marcus deems suitable. Uh, wow. Actually, I changed, I, changed the, I changed the order of the panelists between the two panels and uh, passed out the new order to the seminar, and uh, Marcus was not there. He's a faculty member, and he was teaching when I passed this out. So, so that was my fault, but thank you, Marcus, for joining us and, and agreeing to do this uh, uh, a little later. And uh, for that reason, we'll go an extra 10 minutes on this panel so Marcus can uh, give his talk. Michael, it's all yours. Sure, so let me introduce our think, uh, speakers and then we'll get to it. Uh, first to my left is uh, Professor Mitt Regan, the McDevitt, Professor of Jurisprudence and co-director of the Center for the Study of the Legal Profession at Georgetown University. He's been one of our uh, Stockdale Fellows this year. Another Stockdale Fellow, Professor Joseph Capizzi, Associate Professor of Moral Theology at the Catholic University of America. And then Marcus Hedahl, an assistant professor, uh, second year at the Naval Academy. And then Dr. Ashleen um, Makachno Bagnulo, who is a recent PhD from Notre Dame and our junior fellow in the Stockdale Center this year. So we're going to start off with Mitt Regan. We all have 10 minutes. Where we will be held to that strictly. <coughs> Okay, thank you, Michael. And um, uh, I want to uh, send particular thanks to Ed Barrett for coordinating the faculty seminar this year, which has been just a tremendous uh, experience. So uh, my talk is going to be something of a brisk tour uh, through the, what I might call the rise, fall, and perhaps revival of punishment as just cause. Uh, as Professor Johnson mentioned this morning, classical just war theory considered punishment of wrongdoing a just cause for war. Uh, this idea has been rejected by most modern theorists as well as, uh, in, as by international law, which regards self-defense as the only acceptable basis for war. As a practical matter, however, we can identify several uses of force in recent years that are best explained as retaliation intended to punish an aggressor. One example. In 1993, in response to the attempted assassination of former President George H.W. Bush by Iraq, the Clinton administration launched 23 missiles at the Iraqi intelligence service two months uh, after the attempt. This was widely, widely regarded as punitive retaliation, but the administration formally characterized it as an exercise of self-defense because it could not legally justify it as punishment. How is it that punishment is no longer regarded as just cause? And how do we square this with the persistence of it as a motivation for many uses of force? Well, classical just war theorists were not always precisely clear about what they meant by punishment. Uh, but Vittoria regards uh, someone who inflicts punishment uh, through war as akin to a judge. And if we think of the basic functions of punishment <coughs> in criminal law, they are uh, deterrence, both of the wrongdoer as well as other potential wrongdoers, retribution, uh, and rehabilitation. Some discussions of punishment in the just war tradition um, uh, describe it as a means of deterring future aggression by teaching the aggressor a lesson about the costs of his actions. Other classical discussions focus on retribution, which inflicts punishment on a wrongdoer who deserves it. Finally, uh, Augustine drew on what we might think of as rehabilitation in including moral correction as among the functions served by punishment. Now, this may have reflected his particular focus on conflicts within the church, but more generally, however, as I'll discuss in a moment, this is consistent with the notion of punishment as inflicted within a common moral order. Theorists presented two different accounts of who had standing to inflict punishment. One group, exemplified by Vittoria and Pufendorf, 
explicitly limited the right to punish to the party who had been injured by the aggression. Others went beyond this, authorizing any sovereign to punish violations of the natural law that wronged any party. Grotius and Locke were the most notable exponents of this theory. I think we can gain some insight into the demise of punishment as just cause by focusing on its intellectual foundations. <laughs> First is the idea of a common moral order based on natural law which imposes universal obligations. While there were more expansive notions of the community constituted by this order, I'll focus here simply on sovereigns as members of a moral community. Punishment as retribution within this context rests on the notion that a wrongdoer who disrupts this order must be punished in order to restore it. Again, Vittoria would grant the right to punish only to the injured sovereign, while Grotius would allow any sovereign to punish on behalf of the community as a whole. Punishment as retribution thus aims to enforce justice between and among sovereigns who are members of this community. This common moral order also makes retribution or moral correction a coherent concept. Punishment as correction makes sense only within a worldview that assumes common moral standards to which parties could be redirected, sometimes forcefully, when they strayed. The second intellectual foundation of classical just war theory beyond this notion of a common moral order was what some scholars have called inchoate sovereignty. There was not a sharp distinction between a nation and its people, much less the notion of a state that was a separate entity from both. If a nation was culpable, its people were culpable, and the damage that a just war inflicted on them was in some sense deserved. Now, it's difficult to pinpoint with any precision when we began to move away from this notion of punishment as just cause, but as a conceptual matter at least, the world of sovereign states that emerged with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 set in motion intellectual uh, assumptions that call into question the intellectual foundations of punishment as just cause. In this new order, states become the primary actors on the international stage. They are sovereign in the sense that they are the final arbiter of what is appropriate behavior within their territories. They are diverse in what we might call the conceptions of the good that are the basis for their determinations. They stand as equals in the world of nations and cannot uh, stand in judgment of one another, and any obligations they have to one another are based upon consent. So in this respect, they exist in what we might describe as something at least akin to a state of nature, representing individual rights-bearing parties who determined for themselves the demands of justice. Punishment as just cause is problematic in this conceptual universe. Relationships among states are characterized not by moral uh, existence in a common moral order, but by moral diversity. What constitutes justice is a matter of contention, not consensus, so the thinking goes. No state is in a position to judge one another's behavior. Further, with the state as a rights-bearing entity, conceptually separate from its populace, punishment through war is seen as inflicting damage on the innocent. In this world, the only moral proposition that can gain universal approval among states is the value of self-preservation. Hence, the only just cause for war is self-defense. Punishment is now directed to individuals through various criminal courts and judicial proceedings. We can see how the loss of confidence in a common moral order that governs states in their relationships with one another can erode the basis for the notion of punishment as retribution or as rehabilitation. What about punishment as deterrence? That's best reflected in the practice of using uh, force as a reprisal, even though force technically is an act short of war. There can, of course, be a retributive act aspect to uh, reprisal, but reprisals are often characterized as animated by the desire to inflict damage as a deterrent. Even as punishment faded 
uh, as just cause, reprisals did continue to be accepted. Uh, unlike punishment as just cause, they didn't depend on the notion of a thick moral order or on the idea that one state could judge another. Rather, they can be seen more as an inherent right, akin to the right of self-defense. And so reprisal and deterrence serve the pragmatic goal of enhancing security rather than passing moral judgment. But even armed reprisals have fallen into disfavor. While some countries have reserved the right to use them, various legal authorities as well as commentators now regard them as illegal. What states are now permitted to do is use what are called countermeasures short of force. And the reason is likely that reprisals are seen as creating the risk of being animated by emotion and vengeance, which is at odds <coughs> with the post-World War II uh, paramount goal, as enunciated by the United Nations, of minimizing conflict. But the result, of course, is that acts of, of reprisal often are formally characterized as acts of self-defense in ways that can strain the ordinary meaning of that term. Um, in any event, the ostensible ban on reprisals completes the task of banishing punishment uh, as justification for the use of force. Retribution and rehabilitation are inconsistent with the dominant intellectual foundations that now exist. Punishment as a deterrent is inconsistent with the paramount goal of minimizing armed conflict. I want to close, though, by suggesting that in recent decades, we've seen an effort to create a new common moral order based not on natural law, but on the notion of universal human rights. I mentioned the criminal tribunals. In addition, humanitarian intervention is now regarded as a just cause uh, for aggression. Unlike classical just war theory, though, this moral order governs not relationships between or among sovereigns, but relationships between individuals and between states and their citizens. <clears throat> it represents a challenge to the post-Westphalian world of sovereign equal states who are arbiters of justice within their borders. Humanitarian intervention, for instance, treats territorial control as defeasible, contingent on a state's protection of its citizens. And this individualistic framework uh, based on human rights fits the premises of the age in which we live. But the conduct of states toward one another, interstate relations, still appears to be framed as an arena that lacks a common moral order that could serve as the basis for the use of force or punishment beyond self-defense. Um, the invocation of punishment is a way of helping to constitute a common moral order. So the question is, I think, if we regard sovereignty as defeasible now, based on concern for human rights, might we begin to question it also with respect to the behavior of states toward one another. Might it be possible to imagine an international order that is thicker than one based simply on the desire for self-preservation among <coughs> self-interested actors? Um, I want to mention just one possibility in closing that might <coughs> represent this. Attempts to develop a regime for the punishment of the crime of aggression by the International Criminal Court uh, may reflect this. Prosecution uh, would be of individuals, but the predicate for prosecution is a finding that a state has engaged in the crime uh, of aggression. Now, negotiations over this regime have been quite vigorous. There are a lot of issues still remaining. Uh, and obviously, punishment is not used, uh, not inflicted through the use of force, but judicial authority in accordance with due process. But this enterprise, nonetheless, may reflect an effort to aspire in the realm of interstate relations to something more than simply a state of nature constrained by a thin moral order, order that's based on self-defense. So in that respect, it could be seen as drawing on the classical notion of just theory and its common moral order even uh, as we inhabit a world in which there are different intellectual foundations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Joe Capizzi.
Um, thank you uh, all for coming. My thanks as well to Ed and to Art Athens um, for having me back. This is actually my second year here, so I appreciate that, um, that privilege um, and appreciate the opportunity to think through these questions with everyone. Um, I think as you'll see, actually it, it works out kind of well. My, my presentation I think actually shares some, uh, some themes in common with what Mitch just presented to you, um, although I, I do it a little bit differently and perhaps a little bit um, treacherously by taking uh, by engaging the thinking of Professor Johnson, who is here, um, on this question of sovereignty. I'm going to talk about jurisdiction, or what I'll call jurisdiction, um, throughout this uh, brief presentation, and its relationship to the use of force. One of the things that, I, that at least I learned um, this year in engaging this uh, tradition of thinking on the use of force and on, on the ethics of war is that there is greater sophistication and diversity than is often claimed due in part, um, I suspect, to the complexity of the questions involved. I want to focus on one um, area of questioning in these brief comments, and that is the relationship of jurisdictional concerns to the right to use force. By jurisdictional, I mean the sort of ver vertical and horizontal range of, ranges of action that are recognized as belonging to political governance and usually are embraced by the conception of sovereignty. The jurisdictional question arises continually in the writings of the figures that we looked at this, uh, this year in the tradition, including people like Vittoria and Suarez, Gentili, Grotius, and Locke. The jurisdictional question has implications for current claims about the justifiability of forcible humanitarian intervention by a state acting without having been authorized to act by a competent authority or by the target of that intervention. Today, writers thus wonder about the horizontal limits on governmental authority to intervene in other conflicts, and even um, when they may recognize that something must be done to stop aggression, this launches a further inquiry that provoked elements in the older tradition to ask, upon whose authority do these authorities understand themselves to intervene? In his most uh, recent book, Professor Johnson, uh, this book is called Sovereignty, um, he argues that the older tradition of just war analysis recognized few limitations on the horizontal jurisdictional range of political authority. Though vertical ju jurisdiction was required for authorizing war, and by that I mean the political authority that has no superior alone is authorized to uh, authorize war, the, the authority could authorize the use of force anywhere. Once you identify that you have no superior, you could authorize the use of force outside of uh, interests that actually seem to impinge upon you and you know directly involve injustices involving other parties or other uh, other countries. Johnson believes that Thomas Aquinas is among the advocates of this claim. He writes, for Aquinas and for medieval and early modern just war thought as a whole, the sovereign's obligation to punish evil doing, which is not limited in his discussion to internal disturbances with, within his own political community, but extends to externals as well it might justify the use of the sword against tyrannical rulers over other political communities, right? So sovereign political authority could actually intervene against tyrannies that are oppressing other uh, communities. Thus, sovereign authority could even authorize war against other political authorities if they are understood to be acting tyrannically and if, even if they pose no immediate threat to the government or the authority considering intervention. He locates his claim, as I said, not only in Aquinas, um, but also, as he says, in medieval and early modern just war thought as a whole. He states likewise, for instance, that Vittoria argued the Indians could justly be punished by force of Spanish arms for acting in ways contrary to the laws of nature. Right? So if the Indians are violating the laws of nature, the, you know, the American Indians are violating the laws of nature, the Spanish authorities could intervene in defense of the populations being aggrieved by those activities. According to his narrative, this classic account of just war analysis permits then any legitimate political authority to stand in for justice, to defend it, and to punish the agents of injustice. He lists the virtues of this classical approach, and they are many. Among them include the subordination of power to concern for the good of community, the vigilant maintenance of justice, and the rectification of injustice. Indeed, this account, Johnson writes, intentionally respected the rights of those governed as well of those 
as well as those in other political communities, since its purpose of serving justice and correcting injustice was set in the context of the judicial response to the claims of those governed whose rights had been violated, no matter where those governed might be. He recognizes, of course, that this classic account has faults, but it seems to me that he, seem, you know, he prefers the classic account to its alternative. Over time, that classic account uh, gives way to the state-based approach that um, Mitt just described, um, where you have faithfully in Johnson's uh, characterization the restriction of the range of action of political authority by reference to jurisdictional claims or horizontal jurisdictional claims that are grounded in the post-Westphalian system of states. The current and prevailing just war approach evacuates the older approach's concern for justice in favor of recognizing the rights of states, um, the rights of states within their own jurisdictions to do more or less as they please. States do not appeal to justice to authorize their uses of force, but to self-defense. This is, he shows, a winnowing of the traditional justifications from claims in justice that he traces back to Hugo Grotius. The upshot of Johnson's analysis is that modern developments in the ethics of war have effectively given, and this is a quotation, immunity to tyrannical uses of force within states since the matter of justice in the right use of force was taken out of the picture. I do not have, of course, time to analyze in depth um, his important and sophisticated uh, interpretation of the thinkers involved in this tradition and his, in his claims. I mean, they're, they're provocative and they're powerful. I want instead to finish by raising two points. Um, and I think these two points have, in fact, emerged out of our reading this year and also out of our conversation. The first is that the classic tradition to which Johnson points is, I think, less univocal on the horizontal jurisdictional question than I think his narrative shows. Even in the classic period of reflection on the use of force, there is ambivalence about the rights of political authorities to intervene in each other's affairs. Even Aquinas, whom Johnson cited, doesn't explicitly seem to make a claim of the sort that Johnson has him making. Thomas seems to recognize at times, or even presume at other times, limitations on the horizontal jurisdiction about which we're speaking. When he speaks of legitimate political authority necessary for authorizing war, he appears to be speaking of that authority limited in its own exercise of force by other competing political authorities some of which occasionally might even raise vertical challenges to the jurisdiction claimed by that authority. Likewise, while Johnson cites Victoria as justifying Spanish intervention in Indian violations of the natural law, one might plausibly argue that Victoria is at best ambivalent on this issue. In question two, article five of the, on the Indians, his famous relexio on you know, you know, the relationship of Spanish power to Indian claims to dominium, Vittoria explicitly rejects the sins of the barbarians, which he means violations of the natural law, as a ground for waging war against them, precisely because, according to Vittoria, they lack horizontal jurisdiction. Even the supposed authority of the pope cannot grant Christian princes leverage against, the, uh, against Indian authority. Vittoria even warns in this section that if the sins of barbarians could be used as grounds for waging war against the Indians, then the sins of Christian leaders are worse and would thereby justify actions against them as well. I think one could similarly argue that the case of Grotius is more mixed than Johnson's narrative allows. My second and concluding point follows from this first. One might argue that the reason for the tradition's multivocality, if we want to call it that, and even ambivalence on the relationship of jurisdiction to the use of force, and the consistent return of this question in this literature might be that the problem that we perceive here is in fact an insoluble, insoluble problem. It's, it's not solvable, and instead is a feature of political life. The hesitation and diversity of, the, of opinion I think we find even within thinkers, let alone within the tradition itself, suggests not inconsistency or incoherence, but the uneasy recognition that the justification for the use of force outside of the domestic jurisdiction only operates on an analogy to the use of force within the state. States and other expressions of political authority will continue to grapple with the spaces that are left by the analogy, recognizing, as Elizabeth Anscombe put it, 
The right of political authority to fight for the sake of other people's wrongs is a rather dubious thing. Only in an attenuated sense can it be said that something that belongs to or concerns one is attacked, or something that, that something that belongs to or concerns one is attacked if anybody else is unjustly attacked or maltreated. Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to say thank you to Colonel Athens for this opportunity. Thank you to Ed Barrett for such a wonderful seminar this year and for the opportunity. Thank you to my colleagues. I've learned so much from you and to um, everyone who made the funding possible for my position. I'm a young scholar, and so this has been extremely important time for me. Um, I'm talking about the criterion of um, proper authority, legitimate authority in waging war. So uh, this is one of the first criteria to be developed in the just war tradition. It's something that's come up a lot today. I want to reflect on the reasons for its centrality, some of which we've spoken of earlier. Um, to do this, I want to take us through important ancient and uh, medieval insights into just war theory generally, concluding with three contemporary questions regarding proper authority today. Um, on its face, the tradition's insistence on right authority seems intuitive, and even more than that, it seems uncomplicated. Political authorities making war, that's a commonplace of human history. Men and women relied on one person to lead their wars as a practical matter, and in many ways, early rulership was closely and almost essentially related to the ability to defend one's people. Machiavelli talks about this in his discourses on Libby, um, but Locke expresses it pretty well when he says of the earliest societies, it was natural for men to put themselves under a frame of government, which might best serve to that end of their preservation and choose the wisest and bravest man to conduct them in their wars and in this chiefly be their rulers. But the philosophical and historical relationship between war making and legitimate authority is more than one of expedience and practical necessity. The connections between legitimate authority and warfare have always reflected some of our deepest sensibilities about an important political concept that we've spent a lot of time talking about today, the concept of political sovereignty. Um, particularly in my talk, I want to focus on sources of sovereignty and changing understandings of those sources. Um, the earliest accounts we have concerning proper authority and warfare concern the relationship between the divine and the person selected to rule commonwealth. For example, some of the earliest accounts of Roman warfare focus on the relationship between legitimate authority and divine sanction. Those the Romans sought to best in warfare were sent to ritualize sacred declaration for messengers who represented the authority of the king. The performance of the ritual was meant to communicate the power of the king and to show the relationship between his power and the sacred. Cicero's understanding of the common good as the aim of legitimate authority also meant that for Cicero, Roman warfare was supposed to be conducted with an eye toward what was best for Rome, and the guiding of Rome toward its good was something that mattered for the eternal soul of the ruler, and this is something that Cicero talks about in his Republic. In the medieval period, the just war theory heavyweight Aquinas reveals to us one important aspect of conceptions of sovereignty related to the divine. While it is true that all earthly power comes from God, in the words of Aquinas, a good ruler serves as a vice regent of the people, someone in whom the governed have vested their interest. The sovereignty of the king could be understood, therefore, as something that related, uh, existed in relation to his duty to serve as an advocate for the interest of the people. And, and God had given them these given these people to him for the safeguarding. However, even though I want to emphasize the earliest accounts of sovereignty's relationship to divinity, practical considerations still applied when it came to the importance of legitimate authority in warfare. One reason the Roman king's powers expressed in the messengers he sent mattered so much was because a benefit of relying on legitimate political authority was the clear communication of the threat of warfare, as well as the offering of an opportunity to escape that threat by appeasing what the Romans wanted. Uh, Plato in his laws emphasizes that proper authority in war is needed because it's limits, um, it limits the endeavor to undertake 
war at all, right? Because you have this one person who's doing it and uh, extra political sources, vigilante sources, things like that, are not going to be permitted to, to undertake different kinds of warfare. Um, Raymond Peñafort also focuses on the practical usefulness of a centralized authority in war making. And Suarez tells us that if the ability to declare war is concentrated in a ruler, it ensures that the capacity to make war is subject to the rigor of public counsel and is tempered by the reasoning of several wise voices. Um, Augustine, a thinker who's close to the ancient Romans, he helps to set the stage for medieval inquiry into war, and he also focuses on the usefulness of legitimate authority, but he emphasizes again the moral status of uh, people engaged in war, and, and this brings up another spiritual component. He says in the questions on the Heptateuch that it is legitimate for men to engage in the practice of ambushes, in a just war because, quote, in these matters, the only thing a righteous man has to worry about is that the just war is waged by someone who has the right to do so, because not all men have that right. Augustine, like later thinkers, will interpret the biblical statement that those who take the sword will die by the sword to mean that those who take up arms without authority will find themselves penalized for this aggression with death. So here again, we see the relationship between the divine and early and medieval accounts of legitimate authority. A part of safeguarding the interests of the people one rules is knowing what you could ask of them spiritually. How could a soldier know that if he took up arms, his immortal soul would not be endangered? What could a ruler in good conscience ask the rule to do? Even more importantly in some regards, when could a ruler in good conscience before God seek to make war? A useful part of having the legitimate authority criterion at this point in history was the moral and spiritual responsibility that the prince would feel when he undertook war, and the personal and public accountability he might feel because of his solely possessed authority to engage of war. All of this then is a part of what it means to be a good leader and to rule for the common good at this point in history. In the modern period, the connection between sovereignty and the consent of the governed is made much more central. Social contract thinkers like Locke, Hobbes, and Rousseau emphasize the need for consent as the central part of the origins of political community. And they also focus on the obligation that the sovereign had to the people as one endowed with their vested consent. And this will affect their theories of warfare. Uh, though in each of these accounts, the character of the sovereign differs tremendously in terms of international relations, the sovereign in war was to act as an authorized representative of his citizens on the world stage. So this early modern conception of sovereignty has set the stage for the current understanding of legitimate authority in war. The accountability of the sovereign in war making comes from the people he or she rules, who can make their pleasure or displeasure known to him or her through institutionalized political channels. So today we see variations on the question of legitimate authority based on this modern understanding of sovereignty. Americans sometimes express discontent with presidential authorization for war, given the constitutional insistence on congressional declarations of warfare. So this would be one example of how having um, the powers invested in the US government by its people, they're divided, right? But then there's debate about who represents the most legitimate form of taking this authority to be able to go to war. Recent scholarship has also focused on questions of supranational nat power. What does that mean for sovereignty? What does legitimate authority look like in the face of international coalitions and in the face of entities like the UN? And another, um, another way that we're having to think through concepts of sovereignty now is when we think about the question of legitimate authority and terrorism. How can actors without a state have recourse to war when their authority is by definition illegitimate in the classical sense? There's a lot of new work that is, is being done on this for this concept. So questions like these show that the matter of legitimate authority, while sometimes seen as maybe the least complex, though still important, of the just war criterion, uh, is, is becoming increasingly important for today's warfare as we sort through um, how we would apply these kind of questions and um, when we seek to go to war. So that would be. Professor Hedal. Thanks. Uh, I want to I thank my fellow panelists for being 
flexible. I'm sure it's a, an appreciation not shared by the midshipmen in my class this morning. But nonetheless, I am grateful that, uh, that you've been flexible. I also want to thank Ed for hosting the conference, putting it together, and um, letting me punish him in any way I want. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. That should be fun. Um, especially if that uh, includes perhaps the, the possibility of going to war, if punishment uh, includes the chance of me starting a war with that, uh, I look forward to that. Um, now, uh, some of you might be disquieted or is comforted with this idea of uh, individuals declaring war on one another, and I, I want you to, to revel in that for the next uh, few minutes. Um, the individualistic analogy comparing war to the conflict of individuals is well known uh, to all of us, I'm sure, and I would guess <clears throat> Many of us appeal to us in our classrooms. Uh, I admit I use a, a bar room analogy um, in contrasting preemptive war and preventative war. Um, starting a fight with someone while reaching for a bar stool about to break over your back versus starting a fight with someone based on the fact that you think that there might be trouble later. Um, of course, the individualist analogy has important roots in the just war tradition, as I'm sure many of us are aware. Um, interestingly, and perhaps less well known, um, the use or lack thereof of an individualist analogy has predictable, and in retrospect, not that surprising relationship with several important debates within the just war tradition. Um, so how uh, heavily one leans on it as a justificatory tool um, does play some role in um, a predictive role in how likely one is to have a certain um, position. Um, I take this correlation to be illuminating. Uh, and in the next few minutes, I hope to motivate us to reflect a little bit more on how we use uh, individualist analogies, both as a justificatory tool and as a pedagogical device, since this is both uh, um, a conference about uh, justification and thinking about just war, but also about teaching. Uh, I do want to give two important cautionary notes um, before going further. Um, first, although this project was motivated by differences discovered in our reflection of the just war tradition this year, what follows is an analytic rather than a statistical analysis. Um, and secondly, although there is a wide range of possible uses in considering uh, the use of force at the collective level, both justificatory and pedagogically, of an appeal to the permissible use of force at the individual level, um, and the right answer will almost assuredly be something between an outright dismissal of such comparisons and a wholehearted endorsement of all the lessons of the individualist case to the collective one. Um, nonetheless, I'm going to consider in the next few minutes the advantages and disadvantages of a more wholesale attitude towards an individual's analogy. But the goal of that is just to m engender reflection about what that appropriate role uh, ought to be. So with those caveats noted uh, and time constraints on my mind, let me, I'm just going to consider two advantages and two disadvantages. Um, so one advantage uh, seen throughout the tradition, but particularly in the late medieval period, the individualist analogy simplifies a complex problem, and it does so by capturing a too often uh, under-considered moral element, and that's the importance of reciprocity in moral relationships. Um, closely related, it nicely captures the idea that unfortunately at times force must be met with force. Um, the second advantage you see more frequently in recent theories. Um, the individualist analogy can also capture the intuitive idea that many of us have, I think, that killing is killing. And the moral bar is and ought to be high to either justify it or excuse it, whether it is done by each of us on our own or all of us together under the cover of de decorative fabrics fluttering overhead. Um, so those seem to be useful advantages, but I think there are, I have two concerns as well with an overuse of an individualist analogy. I actually have a few more, but limited to two. Um, all right, so first, it radically alters, and, and I think you see this uh, through the history of the tradition, the, the uh, Augustinian justification for war. So the individualist analogy, by reducing warring states to individuals, makes the reason for war defense of self. And, you know, sometimes others, if you're feeling magnanimous, but mostly oneself and one's own. Um, as all of us are well aware, this is a departure from the more traditional Augustinian tradition of killing in defense of others and others alone. Um, tied to this, and, and I want to make clear, this is theoretically distinct, but I think it's an important pedagogical lesson here. We shouldn't be surprised when our students sometimes balk at the claim that the nobility of the profession sometimes requires combatants to lay down their lives for the non-combatants of the country at which we are at war when we appeal to a defense of one and one's own rather than a defense of others as the primary justification for war in the first place. All right, um, second, reliance on an 
uh, over-reliance on an individualist analogy, I think, can lead to problematic short shiftings of Jewish postbellum concerns and the relationship between use ad bellum and use ad bellum. Um, for taking the warring parties to be equivalent to individual belligerents, we too often lose sight of the important questions raised by the complex moral interactions between those individual members that comprise the warring parties, members who often fail to share fully in the guilt or nobility of the collectives of which they are a part. Um, so let me just conclude um, these brief remarks by saying that, uh, by highlighting again my missionary cautionary note, um, an exorcism of the individualist analogy from our justificatory and pedagogical tool bag would surely be too excessive, but I think it would be well served to recognize that at times at least it can be a crude justificatory and pedagogical, or pedagogical instrument, excuse me, um, one that I think we ought to use sparingly and with care. Thank you very much. I want to thank the Stockdale Center and all the folks who made this day possible, including our support staff, the caterers, everyone who helped us out today. Today I want to talk about the medieval and early modern view of the moral status of combatants, particularly the question of whether or not the nature of the war affected the rights, privileges, and liabilities of the soldiers fighting in the war. I'm going to focus on the work of Francisco de Vitoria for two reasons. One, he's the first a uh, Western thinker to articulate a comprehensive, systematic view of just war theory based on natural law, and two, in siding with one half of a debate that runs throughout the Middle Ages on the topic at hand, he effectively ends the debate, turns the page, and prepares the ground for the consensus that dominates up until our present day. Vittoria conceives of just offensive war as retributive, an extension of a prince's domestic law enforcement responsibilities. The unjust prince, the bad guy in this exchange, has no belligerent rights in return. The unjust prince is sinning, abusing the power of his office and violating the peace that God desires between human communities. Now, if the prince who knowingly leads his troops on an unjust mission is doing something culpably unjust. What about his troops? The picture is complex, as Vittoria shows us. Initially, Vittoria seems to speak of the prince's soldiers as accomplices who share in the guilt of the prince inasmuch as they are helping him do an unjust action. Now, this suggests that the moral inequality of the antagonistic princes replicates among their troops. You have a good prince, a bad prince, so therefore you must have good soldiers and bad soldiers. On this line of thinking, there should be no equal belligerent privileges. On this line <coughs> of thinking, only one side gets to fight, morally speaking. But we have to ask, guilt in what sense? Is Vittoria assuming the unjust prince's soldiers are culpable accomplices, like bank robbers, or are they only materially guilty for aiding this unjust project? What that means is they're objectively wrong, but subjectively innocent. That Vittoria means material guilt is eventually clarified in his discussion of combatants' responsibilities. A soldier must refuse to fight if the war seems to him patently unjust. In such a case, he would then be knowingly contributing to the killing of innocent people. And that's something, of course, that you cannot do ever. However, despite these high stakes, Vittoria curiously says and famously says the soldier is not required to investigate the justice of the war, deferring to his prince's judgment. Now, it's worth exploring this point further because we might ask why are soldiers not obliged to rigorously examine the justice of the war given the nature of what's at stake. Vittoria argues that commoners cannot be efficiently informed of deliberations about a pending war. They lack the power anyway to do anything about it. Failure to obey could endanger the commonwealth and finally that insubordination raises other problems unto itself. Now, each of these points could and have been contested, particularly by modern authors. 
Vittoria's blitheness regarding soldiers' duties is better understood if we wrap our heads around his take on the default obligation of obedience. The Augustinian notion of justice these scholastics, like Vittoria, absorb is that of a political order in which the different stations of society and different households are harmoniously and rightly ordered. A soldier's obeying his prince is the way in which a soldier can contribute to this social harmony. Since justice also entails harmony between political entities, a patently unjust war set on creating a non-harmonious peace of domination, this clearly wouldn't serve justice. And so justice would not be served by the soldier obeying in this kind of unjust war. Vittoria and many other theologians are clear that the soldier's knowledge is the pivot point determining whether he should adhere to his normal obligation of obedience or not. Clear knowledge of the injustice of war trumps his obligation of obedience and implicates the soldier in the unjust collective project. It's no longer in this case a virtue to obey, since all virtues are in the Thomistic formulation, dispositions to obey reason promptly. And it's obviously not rational to perpetrate wide-scale injustice. So again, Victoria speaks of, when he speaks of the guilt of soldiers on the unjust side, acknowledging an incipient asymmetry between soldiers, he must mean material guilt. This follows since most of the time most soldiers will be behaving permissibly, non-culpably, when fighting in a plausibly just war. That's soldiers on both sides. Victoria states clearly that in a war where there's an objective asymmetry between just and unjust sides, it is also possible for both sides to be just in the sense that one side is objectively just and the other side is invincibly ignorant of the injustice of their cause. They can't be blamed. In such a condition, the unjust side soldiers are not culpable. Meanwhile, they are doing something they should be doing, which is obeying their prince in a plausibly just war. Material guilt entails the just prince's ordering enemy troops targeting, but after the war, once the material threat is neutralized and a more objective assessment of culpability is possible, enemy soldiers should not be punished. In a further aspect of equality between the two sides, each side is equally sinless before God. So long as they serve in cases of plausible justice and they avoid the personal vices of bloodlust or malice and so on. Now, there's a final sense in which combatants on either sides of a conflict are unequal, and this is pointed out by our colleague Gregory Reichberg. While acting permissibly, the invincibly ignorant soldier on the unjust side is not performing a virtuous action. He's acting permissibly, but not virtuously. He's not performing a just act, not performing a courageous act, because only actions that objectively contribute to the good are candidates for being virtuous actions. So this is strange. He's acting permissibly, but he doesn't get extra special credit for being virtuous. So, Having clarified the moral status of soldiers on the unjust side, we have to now talk about what they're permitted to do. Materially guilty soldiers on the unjust side are targetable, but they're not liable to violence in the modern sense of the term of liability in the sense of not being permitted to defend themselves. In most cases, both sides soldiers are objectively permitted to fight. Soldiers on the unjust side are behaving properly in serving their prince in a plausibly just war. On an objective level, these soldiers are acting unjustly, but they're behaving properly in response to action-guiding norms. Now, this confusing duality is resolved if we recall that scholastic morality is agent-centered. Works of moral theology were used to teach priests to administer the sacrament of reconciliation. So questions of the agent's subjective knowledge and intention had to be asked in order to assess the gravity of his sin and the measure of his penance. This applies to both princes and to soldiers. So princes are called on to fight in only just wars in the context of discharging their royal duties. 
They're counseled to only launch wars if they're certain of the justice of their cause. Soldiers are similarly counseled to make the best decision available to them, which in their station in life usually means obeying their princes. Whether or not they are culpable for their materially unjust acts turns on their knowledge rather than the victim's status. The agent-centered nature of, of Vittoria's approach explains why the non-liability of the soldier on the just side does not lead Vittoria, like modern revisionist philosophers, to prohibit the non-culpable soldier on the unjust side from fighting and then considering grounds of excuse when he does. I want to make a final comment about excuse. The modern notion of excuse means you're doing something objectively wrong, but you're subjectively forgiven for doing what you're doing. The soldier fighting in an unjust war that seemed just is not like a civilian who joins a mob and lynches an apparently guilty but actually innocent man. The civilian shouldn't be killing this innocent man and shouldn't be participating in a mob at all. By contrast, it does not seem right to say the soldier makes a mistake by serving in an unjust war because his profession inherently involves risks and uncertainty and the necessity of making decisions with little information. Like a judge, we can say the soldier is doing the right thing when he acts in good faith and makes the best professional decision available to him, even in a moment when he's doing something that's objectively wrong. I do not think we are inclined to say judges should be excused when they condemn innocent people on occasions when the evidence points overwhelmingly to that suspect's guilt. Rather, we praise them for properly following their institutional procedures. So in closing, unlike typical excusal cases, people should imitate judges who convict defendants implicated by the evidence and should, Victoria argues, imitate soldiers who follow their sovereigns into all but obviously unjust wars. Thank you. And now I will stay here and act as referee for questions you may have for our panel. We have 20 minutes. Please. Well, Michael, first I want to thank you for that, that uh, very, very nice unpacking of Victoria. It shows that there's a lot more to the debate than what Jeff McMahon puts out there. Uh, but my real uh, point is a point of personal privilege to Joe Capizzi. Uh, <laughs> not because he has caught me out, but because it turns out that we agree a lot more than he's willing to admit. Uh, the, um, I, my memory is that I developed the, the things that you were talking about in the chapter on R2P, where, the, uh, where, where one of the issues that I talk about is the, uh, the original ISIS retorts uh, granting permission to not only the Security Council, but also to uh, regional alliances and even in, in some cases individual states to, uh, to uh, protect vulnerable populations. And uh, I'm sure that the writers had in mind the, the typical cases that everybody cites, uh, uh, Vietnam and Cambodia against Pol Pot, and uh, Tanzania and Uganda against Sidi Amin, and uh, Nigeria and Sierra Leone, was it? Uh, at any rate, uh, the, the uh, 2005 World Summit decisively backed away from this and uh, admitted only for the use of force when it was <coughs> authorized by the Security Council. So what I was trying to do was to see how to, how to connect what the historical uh, tradition had to say about, about this to, uh, to this R2P question. And, and another <coughs> issue there is that unlike the Islamic tradition where you begin with a, a, a us versus them international kind of uh, a conflict that you're trying to talk about in moral terms. In just war tradition, you begin with what is fundamentally an internal focus. And you have to move from that to the focus of, uh, of dealing with uh, different political communities. The key word in that one passage you quoted of mine is might. Aquinas never actually says that 
the sovereign should intervene, or even clearly that he has the right to intervene. He's, he's very cautious about that. Uh, and, and the reason he's cautious about that is that he doesn't want usurpation, and he doesn't want uh, uh, action that might be uh, itself a case of tyranny, and he doesn't want support for sedition, which is, after sure. all, a moral sin. <clears throat> And, and he, he treats this subject uh, in, in two different, well, in, really in three different places, in three different books, and he treats it somewhat differently and, and very sketchily in each one of them. So one has to make a judgment where all this goes. <laughs> and I made my judgment, okay? Uh, uh, others may disagree with it, but it, uh, it seems to me to be a reasonable judgment based on what Aquinas was arguing. But his, his preference when uh, encountering tyranny and, and the, protection of vulnerable populations comes to mind here. He says in one place, if, if the tyranny isn't too bad, it's better just to put up with it. But then the, the next thing is, if it turns out that it really is too bad, then uh, others in higher positions of authority within the society ought to take the lead in, in trying to depose the tyrant. And in that connection, uh, another sovereign can, can be brought in and can decide to help out. So uh, I think that there are some very real constraints on, on uh, sovereigns just uh, willfully, willy-nilly uh, acting to uh, shape up their neighbors. Uh, and, uh, and yet, the, the, you know, it, it's still basically the same kind of question you have in the R2P debate between the original ISIS report and the 2005 World Summit. Uh, Um, what to say except I'm honored uh, to know that I agree with Jim Johnson more than I disagree with him apparently. Um, uh, yeah, I mean that, that, that all makes sense to me. Um, I, I think even what you said with, even with regard to Thomas shows that even within these thinkers there's a recognition of um, you know, what we might call a tension or something between like de facto political authority and, and you know, de jure or moral authority. And, and I guess what I was uh, the small points I was trying to make is that there is this diversity of opinion, even within some of these thinkers. That tension gets played out in different directions by different of these guys at different times. And even the, what, you, what you call the classic tradition itself seems to have those differences of opinion as well. Um, so what I'm suggesting, that here's the, the prospective stuff, the, you know, the, the stuff for both of us to continue thinking about is this may be unresolvable, you know, even the R2P 2P question may be unresolvable. It just may be that kind of tension that we have to experience um, in, in politics. And the ongoing effort of politics is just to try to figure out who here and now has authority rather than a priori make these kinds of judgments. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm open to that being wrong as well. Other questions? Can we ask questions of each other? <laughs> Go ahead. I mean, if nobody has any questions for us. Um, yeah, uh, <coughs> I have a question. Um, uh, Joseph Capisi. <laughs> yes, still me. Um, I, I have a question for you, Michael. Um, I, I mean, and I'm sure you anticipate this question. It's about, um, it's about the, uh, the soldiers uh, and their knowledge and their activity. Um, so you were at one point referred to the extra special credit um, soldiers might get, um, that, or in fact that they don't get, um, when they are on the objectively unjust side, um, but they more or less don't know it. Um, so they can act permissibly in this circumstance, but they don't get like virtue. Uh, and mm -hmm. I mean, and this, and you, and you know the question that's coming at you, this, it, that's a provocative and powerful claim. Um, very often in war, uh, the, the justice of the causes is, is, you know, it's a close call, right? Um, these are not yeah. often black and white calls. So are we really prepared to say that a soldier who fights in a situation where, you know, the, you know, the, is tilted in the direction of the other guy is not actually acting courageously? 
So, you know, we've discussed this before about right. the unity of the virtues. And Aristotle's famous claim is that you can only really be behaving virtuously if you're contributing to the good, if you're contributing, if you're doing things that are objectively correct. And so a bank robber who repels down eight floors and fights off many guards with no regard for his own safety isn't really courageous because he's not acting towards the good. Sure, sure. And, and, a, and Thomas, of course, absorbs that in Vittorio through Thomas. Absolutely. And so that's, that's the scholastic view, is that even though you may be slaying enemies left and right and, and saving your own men and doing everything that looks courageous, it's not true courage if it's not in the interest of the good. In the spiritual economy that God, of which God is the arbiter, you're not moving closer to the earthly perfection you're not making God's job easier, perfecting you through grace. Um, and so from a secular point of view, a modern point of view, I think most of us are comfortable saying that there could be courageous Nazi soldiers, even though it hurts our mouths a little bit to say it. Yeah. You know, in, in the more casual sense we use courage, I think you and I are more comfortable saying sure. Would your, would your answer be different with respect to soldiers on the unjust side who make extraordinary efforts to save civilians, for instance? So isn't that interesting? So in the context of an unjust war, if you do something that's clearly just like saving civilians, you'd think that would be virtuous on the Thomistic notion. Now I see uh, Dr. Reichberg has his hand up. Sure. I mean, as, as you know, he says a number of different things which, if taken in isolation, give you a totally different reading. And his first, you know, the earliest uh, uh, mention of the subject, he seems to talk about the soldiers on the unjust side as if they're complicit, as if they're bank robbers following a robber baron who know exactly what they're doing. And then he goes on to say things that complicate that, that narrative. And so, I ask the same question, putting this together. Is he assuming most people are complicit and then adds his qualifications about people who are invincibly ignorant? And I think, I'm, I mean, we're reading tea leaves here. Um, but I, I would incline towards the other reading that he assumes that most people are not complicit. And here's my thinking, that his invocation of invincible ignorance is very weak. It's a very uh, shallow invincible ignorance. Because what invincible ignorance means is that you can't there, there are two relevant senses in the way in which Aquinas uses invincible ignorance. Invincible ignorance in an antecedent sense in which you're doing something normally permissible you had no way of knowing would lead to some kind of unjust effect. And so I ask myself, is Vittoria looking at soldiering as something like that, something that's benign and will very rarely lead to an unjust effect? 
And on one hand, it seems like he can't be doing that because he knows many wars are unjust. And yet he tells soldiers, don't worry about it. You don't have to investigate the causes of the war, just follow your prince. That makes it sound like it's a fairly benign profession like farming. So I think why he's doing that is, or why he's led to do that and present soldiering in that kind of way is because if you're a pious medieval person and you think this is a morally hazardous profession that, enri that endangers your soul more times out of not, why in the world would I enter soldiering? I'd rather be a farmer and keep my nose clean. And, but it's, uh, Vittori would say, it's a moral good to protect your commonwealth through military means. And so soldiering has to be presented as a permissible, viable profession. And so I think in order to present it as a permissible profession, the confessor has to lower his expectations of the epistemic duties of soldiers. I think the confessor has to believe that God effectively grades soldiers on a curve, <laughs> that God gives soldiers the benefit of the doubt. And so I think, in my reading, that's where Victoria, that's what he has to mean. Maybe we can, maybe we can talk about it later. David. Yeah, I, I'm wondering whether, I mean, I, I find this stuff incredibly interesting. And the, you know, the riches that this tradition has to offer I think is the, you know, the biggest discovery to me for the year. Um, I'm wondering uh, how much we can, uh, how ahistorical, uh, how ahistorical are the arguments? <coughs> I mean, one of the things that strikes me about this conversation you know, also the discussions of rightful authority. I mean, we know that historically so many of these medieval wars were fought by mercenaries. Um, you know, we know that the, the, the reason that the Vatican has Swiss guards now is that uh, before they discovered chocolate banking and clocks, <laughs> uh, the Swiss were impoverished people who sent all their young men off with, with pipes to be, to do stuff for pay. So, when, the, when these thinkers are writing about rightful authority, when they're writing about you know, follow your prince, or your prince is the guy who hired you, or your prince is some local prince who got hired by a bigger prince, and you're just following this guy because he was hired. I mean, this, this is, this is you know, it, I mean, to me, this is a big question because of course, right now, private military contractors are a big issue, and that seems to be, in many ways, the counterpart to the, the mercenaries of the medieval period. <coughs> but it, it does make me wonder, what were the theorists talking about? I mean, they knew what the armies were. I mean, the armies were not people defending their homeland, necessarily. They were people following uh, you know, desperately poor people who were going where their sword could be purchase and it's true of the knights as well. So. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have a, a sort of a reflection on that. Um, yeah. I think that one of the reasons that, uh, so to take it from the perspective of the ruler rather than the soldier, the ruler being able to make a decision about what's good for the commonwealth uh, is serving a function like for the entire community. And so it's sort of like invested in him is, is um, this idea that if he, he has a moral responsibility to try to make the decision for the common good of the commonwealth. So then the soldier in that case can follow his orders if the, the prince is following his appropriate theor philosophical and theoretical role without, without too much uh, trepidation. So because I think in the earlier traditions that's part of why there's so much, much weight on, on proper authority. Is it, it's a type of um, streamlined accountability, maybe. But, but it also fits in with the way that they think about what the role, uh, um, the relationship between the common good of a, a state and uh, the role of a prince. So if you have someone like, like a soldier, like you're talking about, I, do, I think they do know the desperate circumstances and the mercenary circumstances, but that the focus is on I don't know, in earlier traditions on, on moral responsibility and, and the prince plays an important role that allows other people to wash their hands. I don't know. Can I take, can I take a quick crack yep, at that? Sure, and then we have to end. Yeah, really quick. Um, 
I love that question too. Um, and and it, it, it's actually like, in a way, it's almost a version of the question that often gets put to people like us when we write about war. You know, like they may be a historical, but we're a experiential, right? So you know, how dare I speak about what you know soldiers go through or what you know what, what soldiers are thinking, right? So there's a kind of there's a there's a version of that question that you know is as easily put to I think us as academics who think about these kinds of things. Um, but just a real quick response, and maybe Greg would differ with me on this position, but this. When I studied Aquinas on slavery, or like you know, um, the issue of slavery in medieval thinking, uh, that same kind of issue arises. What do these guys know about slavery? What were they talking about when they talk about slavery? And there is a position of thinking that you know just thinks they're just dealing with ahistorical categories, you know, and they're just working through categories and cashing them out. I was never moved by that. Um, I, it seemed to me that it was, on the one hand, kind of presumptuous in favor of us, you know, that we, you know, we moderns have, you know, better historical senses of things. But it also, it wasn't really defended. I mean, it, 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 a lot of these guys, like including Thomas, lived in places where slaves were traded. You know, lived, in, you know, grew up in places where slaves were traded. I think we should assume that these guys, um, and certainly Victoria, right? But I think Thomas as well had also, you know some historical sensibilities about these questions that are in, in uh, probably blind in the ways that uh, we're blind um, and informed in at least some of the ways that we're informed and maybe some others as well. We are out of time. We can continue this conversation during the break, but let's uh, give a hand to our panel.